what we really want for you coming out of here today is sort of understand what the step code's all about, right? We want you to really understand the metrics. Now, as noted, we're gonna stray from just talking about airtight list to really talking about the other metrics. And what happens, for example, when you put a heat pump in? What does that do? What happens when you choose the other type of heating system? What about different types of um, building envelope approaches? Um, again, we'll still be focusing a lot on the role of the energy advisor in the step code, and we'll be focusing on the compliance report. This is the Township of Langley version of this report, and if you have this completely incorrectly filled out, this is everything you need to pass the step code to meet your target, provided you, your, your home meets the target. So th there's great importance is putting on making sure building inspectors in the future will be looking at this and checking your plans, checking this, make sure they match, and then asking you questions about where you're at and making sure you're checking. This, this is the report that you'll need to come become familiar with. In other local government areas, they're going to be adopting the provincial version of this report, which is very similar. Um, there's a couple of different other sections on it as well. Um, but you'll be starting to see these a lot more as local governments adopt the BC Energy Step Code. So, quick review. The Township of Langley has sort of a tiered approach. One's outside their development permit areas. They've adopted Step 1. We'll go into what that is in a moment. And inside their development permit areas, they have Step 2. And we'll talk about what Step 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 are all about. And they're planning on progressively increasing this um, to 2022. And then in consultation with builders and industry, um, and then seeing where they go from there. The Township of Langley also has a range of financial incentives available for builders who want to participate in the program. There's uh, financial incentives for energy modeling, for hiring an energy advisor, for mid-construction blower door testing, and for achieving the upper steps. Because the Township of Langley is requiring the lower steps, there's no incentives for those. But if you are building a step four or step five, um, there's either a thousand or fifteen hundred dollar incentive. So as noted, this is the compliance report. We'll focus a lot of our talk today around this while we're talking about like some really specific details about the building. All this stuff for if you're building in the Township of Langley is available on their website and they have uh, details about their step code regulation, these compliance reports and their incentives. So what's the BC Energy step code here? It's a performance based approach. In the past, we had a prescriptive approach. This kind of windows, this type of insulation, do this, this and this, you're gonna pass the code. But what happened I think when the people who managed the building code saw when they started looking at different types of homes, they found that homes were built a really wide variety of efficiency that putting this type of insulation and this type of wall in different types of homes, so many different types of sizes, wasn't really intend meeting the intended goals of, of the code. The code was for the energy efficiency components was trying to say, great, we're, we're improving the efficiency of buildings. And that just wasn't working to the same level that was expected. Now there's an energy model required where you will give the plans to a building energy advisor, ideally as early as possible, and a bunch of details. What type of heating system are you considering? What type of windows? The energy advisor takes that information, puts it in an energy model, then also does a blower door test. We'll talk about the benefits of mid-construction blower door test, but there's a requirement for a final blower door test. All these types of inputs they, they put in, and the better the information you can give the energy advisor, the better the energy model will be. Step code is also a voluntary compliance option. You can, in any given community, build to whichever step you want or your client wants. No local government in the near term is going to require a step five or even a step four, but builders are building to that, those levels already, so we know it's doable. And there's incentives available in lots of communities for voluntary building to the higher levels. Communities you'll note that not all communities are adopting the step code yet. It's, they can voluntarily decide to adopt it. When they voluntarily adopt it, then it becomes mandatory for you as builders. Um, but the intent, what the province has done, they said in local governments that so make this a priority and they feel there's the industries ready, they are allowed to start introducing the step code as long as they put the policy in place. So we'll see Township of Langley has, has, has decided to do so as of January 1st, 2019. Why they're doing this is because this is where it's going nationally. The federal government and the Canada Building Strategy says this is where we're going for 2030. So we have about 10 years or so to basically change how across Canada, how building codes are being working. And it's going to a performance-based approach. And what it is, it's a pathway to net zero ready construction. So net zero ready is essentially a home that's built efficient enough that you have, if you were to put some renewables on it, like the solar panels, that it would, you could generate all the electricity you need within a year. That's where they're going for 2030. So that's a big change from what we have now. Whether or not that's exactly where we end up in 2030, and in British Columbia that target is 2032, um, is to be seen. Um, the step code is designed to 
change as it gets input from industry and others. So we don't know exactly where we're going, but what we know is we're going to a much higher level of efficiency by 2032 in British Columbia. The first step is enhanced compliance. So if you were to meet step one, when a local government says step one, what they're basically asking you is saying is, we want you to use a performance approach to build the code. So they're not really saying you're doing anything more than you should have already been doing. That home you built performs as well or better than a building constructed to the minimum requirements of the building code. So it's not really a huge leap saying it's doing it, but they're gonna be testing and verifying it. And what we found in the past is that many homes that um, were sort of proposed to be built to code weren't actually meeting code if you really looked at it. So this is a, a way now for them to sort of verify that code is being met at step one. It's also a consistent approach. In the past, um, across the province, different local governments put all kinds of different requirements in. And I think that what they heard from the building industry is that, oh, I'm building in this place, I'm required to do this, I'm required in that place, I'm required to do this. Now, while as the step code's early, some are adopting sooner than others, that's still kind of happening, it's not consistent. But the intent is that over time, as local governments sort of put in a regulation, they can't just do anything, they can adopt a step code. And it's gonna be the same, right? So you're not gonna be uh, some different requirement, they can build different parts of the steps, but at least the industry knows this is the pathway local government's gonna be adopting. It's not some, something else, some other type of program. It's gonna be, they're gonna be adopting a step code. Pretty much what it is meant is to give transparency to industry is this is where we're going. And by 2030, we're gonna be increasingly ratcheting this up. So let's get ready. Let's figure out what we need to do to um, meet the requirements of the step code. It also does so by it setting a, a series of measurable energy efficiency targets. And we're gonna spend a lot of our day looking at these, but then trying to bring them down to practical terms and talk about what does, um, mechanical energy use intensity really mean in a home. So each step has a different requirement. Additional things were changed the last year that if, based on the size of the home, so mechanical energy use intensity, which we'll focus on, if you're building a different sized home, you're gonna have a different target. If you have space cooling equipment, you're gonna have a different target as well. When you look at this chart, it just looks like a whole bunch of numbers and it like, doesn't make much sense, but we, what we're gonna try and do is talk through this and really let you know what this means when you're building a home and why certain things are important to consider right from the beginning. And again, a core focus of the step code is that the performance requirements of the building envelope, right? The intent of this is this code is trying to make people focus on the code. In, in the past, for various programs, you could just put in like a really high efficient boiler or a heat pump, basically done, right? You're gonna hit that performance target for a, a other program. Now it's saying, well, no, we're, we don't want people just relying on a really efficient heating system. We want that focus on the building envelope. Air leakage is really important. There's a, the recognition that, you know, sort of heating systems come and go in 15 years. How, how, how good are the heating systems probably going to be? You know, we've seen tremendous leaps and gains in, in heat pump technology in the last, you know, 10 years. What's going to happen in 15, 20 years from now? Probably gonna a lot more improved heating systems. And for builders, w the good of this is that there's a lot more flexibility to innovate, create, find new cost-effective solutions, different ways of, of dealing with uh, pot lights and you know, mechanical and electrical stuff. Like we're, as industry adapts to this and starts to think about, wow, it would be really expensive to do that way, well, we could probably do something better that maybe didn't happen in the past because there was sort of no requirement that pushed the envelope to getting there. Now it is, people are going to start thinking, well, how can we do better foundations? How can we do better air barriers? we should be maybe pushing for better types of heating systems. Um, and how do we do this cost effectively? So all these things come into play when you're doing the step code. You, there is no fixed recipe like in the past. Prescriptive path, you said put this type of window, this type of insulation, check, 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 you're done. Now it's like, well, there's many, many more options um, for, for a builder to achieve or for someone, as, as Larry said, people want different things in their home, right? They want this type of heating system. They want more windows. They want more of this. You can do that and then try and find the balance on how you can do the step code too. So it's gonna be this, so the provincial version that looks very much like this you're gonna to have to have. The intent was in each local government area they shouldn't be developing you know, completely different ways of reporting on things. It should be a sort of standardized approach. Everyone knows what it is. Over time you work with an advisor, you know you need to give them this type of information. Um, to be clear, building inspectors know it's this type of information they should be looking for, then hopefully we're all singing from the same song sheet. There's a pre-construction version of this, which we're looking at here today. And this one you have today is essentially, it, well, not essentially, it is the, the mid-construction, or pre-construction report for this home. So it lists all the details on here, and we'll be looking at this. This is done at the early stage and given with your building permit. So building inspectors will be looking at this and making sure it's complete. They'll be 
checking if in the area where they have step two, does it look like you're going to hit step two? Okay, well, I see everything in here. It looks like you're going to meet step two. If they see that you're right on the cusp for one of these targets we'll look at, then they might say, well, how are you going to, it looks like you're right on the, the borderline here. Um, they might bring that up and say you should work with your energy advisor to make sure you have a contingency plan by doing something else. So this is what they'll be looking at at the building permit phase. When it's all said and done, there's going to be another version of this that verifies and someone like Stan or someone has to sign off it and say, I've checked over this. I did the mid-construction blower door test. The information as far as I've seen and received from the builder is complete and they have to sign and it's sort of a, a liability to them signing said, yep, this has been achieved. What part of this is is a tool for uh, industry protection, but it's also consumer protection. One, if you're a builder building a, co uh, a step three level home and someone else in the past was saying that, you know, they're, oh, my home's more efficient than that person's home. Well, this is really what it's to do is saying it's supposed to level the playing field. If someone's saying they're building to a certain level, well, you have a third party proving it. So you use uh, builders you, you know, in a competitive marketplace. Um, energy efficiency is only one of the things, but it's meant to level the playing field and make sure everyone's sort of playing doing what they're supposed to be doing, so people aren't cutting corners they shouldn't be. For consumers, uh, what this is supposed to do is, so, well, if this is step one, we at know this has met the minimum energy efficiency requirements of the code. In the past, we don't, there wasn't really a way for a consumer to know that their home has actually met the minimum requirements of the code, because many homes really weren't. Um, this is intending to make sure that th the codes, building codes meeting its intended purpose. There's been a lot of builder input in the development of the step code. The step code is going to evolve. It's going to change. The step code metrics have already changed. They will change again. They are taking lots of builder input back, <coughs> particularly on, as Larry said, the, the affordability uh, cost. So as efficiency requirements get stricter and stricter, that's definitely going to impact affordability. So how can affordability be maintained um, while efficiency gets ratcheted up? That's a huge challenge. Quickly here, now, what does it measure? We're going to go into details. One, performance requirements of the building envelope, equipment and systems, and, and importantly, air tightness. And it is complicated, but when you break it down and start, people are building various homes and they understand the components that make it, it's less complicated. Particularly when you engage an energy advisor that's meant to translate all these things for you. So we have the step code metrics for each one of them here. There's air tightness, each step. You'll notice in step one, there is no air tightness target. There's a percentage less in reference house we'll go into here. For mechanical energy use intensity and Teddy, we'll explain all these things. This is the core of a, the thing you need to understand. For mechanical energy use intensity, and we'll look at the example again, it looks at building size and it looks at cooling systems. Another important thing to think about this when we're thinking about the step code is the house as a system concept. It's basically saying is great, you build thicker walls, more efficient, you can do a smaller heating system. Or it's you build a leakier home, well, you're going to have to replace that air, that heat loss with a, with a larger heating system potentially. So it all interacts. So, and part of the step code in achieving cost efficiencies is over time, I think the hope and goal is better building envelopes, new innovations on building better envelopes, more skilled crews at doing better air tightness is going to allow to bring the cost down to that. And ideally into the future, step five, you need a very small heating system. That's why many passive houses are basically have almost like a minimally sized heating system. So there's some cost savings there, but you're putting a lot more into your building envelope. So the intent of this, again, is bringing it back to the building envelope, understanding the interaction between all these things. If you don't achieve your air tightness, you might not get some of your other targets. Now this is a, on step two and three or four and five, it's a pass or fail. So if we look at energy intensity and why that's important, energy intensity is how much energy does this house consume divided by the heated floor area. For a small house, 75 gigajoules, if you look at energy intensity, it's 0.46. For the larger house, it's 0.23. Even though these homes consume exactly the same amount of energy in total, the larger house is more efficient when you look at the size of it. And it's had to do more, this home for example, it's had to do more. It's got, you'll see, you know, ICF, you see the spray foam, you see the heating systems. It's had to do more to consume the same amount of energy as the small house, but this is why it becomes different. The step code's energy intensity metrics, so smaller homes in some cases might have more challenges on certain elements, and we'll talk about that as we move forward. So it's really important to understand that these are energy intensity metrics, and it's, not, it's, it's a different thing. And the, the intent of having an energy intensity metric was, it does sort of complicate things, but 
to sort of compare the energy consumption of different homes by square footage. It's basically saying, well, we're not, the, the, the code's not going to say you can't build a large home. It's going to say you have to hit certain energy intensity targets regardless of the size of the home. You build a bigger home, well, you're going to have to do something else to make sure you hit your target, particularly as you get higher and higher. Building step five, a very large home, where you're going to have to put a lot more money into insulation and to make sure you, you can hit your step five target. So when we look at air tightness, what this is, and again, it's, this is sort of an intensity metric too. It's how much air exchanges out of a home, air changes per hour divided by the building volume. Again, for this home, because it's large, when you start dividing it by the, the, the building volume, it's sort of, in some cases, it's easier, right, to hit your target because it's getting divided. But in the other cases, they had to put a lot of work into the air, the air barrier approach. Why do we need air tightness testing? One, it's a step code requirement. And two, when looking at past data in the province, 2017, a lot of homes would not be meeting step two of a step code. This is the average air changes per hour. Step two says you need to meet three. Well, the median, sorry, is 3.8 and it's worse for townhomes. So, and in the code, the code assumes that people are actually getting 2.5. So here's an example of why, these are builders that are already doing energy modeling, probably doing more on tear tightness than, the, than most builders are actually doing. Those builders that have already been paying attention to it, the median air tightness is not passing it. So it shows us that the prescriptive approach to the code for air tightness was not working, right? This is data that shows it wasn't working. And why wasn't it really working? Well, we weren't really uh, testing it in a way to quantify. Builders didn't know. They're doing, they're following a prescriptive thing for air leakage. Do this, this, and that, you'll hit it. But it doesn't work that way, right? It doesn't catch errors. It doesn't catch different types of building approaches and building assemblies, that, things that happen along the way. And unless you have someone testing and quantifying it, you don't know what you're hitting, right? It's impossible to know. You can kind of try and do as best you can, but you can't know. So this is why um, now the step code has requirements. Step two, Township of Langley, you have to hit three. Or you pass. Don't pass, sorry. So this is why it's, it's important and why some of the challenge lies in, you know, a lot of these homes are built well, but not hitting it, right? These are good, these are great homes, but they're just not hitting that target. And that's more attention needs to, be, to go on to air tightness. But for builders, you know, the, the intent of building airtight is, you know, reducing condensation risk within assemblies. People want to buy a home that's going to last for a long time, hopefully, not get, you know, lead to leaky condo syndrome. You know, so it protects the integrity of the building envelope. It may allow, the higher you get in the steps, allow for smaller, more efficient heating systems, as we're seeing in more efficient homes. Uh, you know, reduces heat loss and heat gain, saves on energy. There's the environmental benefit of, you know, a greenhouse gas emission reduction. And really why a lot of local governments are adopting this is because local governments have uh, environmental mandates to reduce greenhouse gases, and that's why a lot of local governments are getting into this. Utilities are supporting it because um, they, they have requirements to uh, support industry and, and um, consumers to reduce energy consumption. But for, for local governments, it is the environmental benefit. And more efficient homes have better indoor air quality, and you know, there's you know, increases in thermal and sort of acoustic comfort. So you know, a more efficient home is going to maybe quieter. And that's where Stan said some of his clients were living on a really, by a really busy highway. So they asked for like, you know, the most, the most soundproofed windows. And that allowed them to do a trade off somewhere else because they did more efficient, more expensive windows that allowed them to spend a little bit less somewhere else uh, on the insulation. It wasn't that case. When we look at this particular home, but this is the key element of it. This chart says whether you pass or fail. On this particular home, for step three here, they have to achieve 2.5 air changes. At our mid-construction test, it showed that this one achieved 1.1. So this is lower than the step four requirement, right? So that's getting to where close to step five requirement for this home. And, but what we see here and how this interrelates when we look at uh, thermal energy demand intensity in a moment, what that means, they have a maximum of 30. We'll explain what this means 30 in a minute. And because air leakage impacts the thermal energy demand intensity, the maximum this house could go would be 1.38, or they wouldn't hit this 30. However, we already know this home's well on its way. It's achieved 1.1. They're going to be doing more air sealing as drywall and other pieces come in. There's a few things they're addressing as they, that they identified. So they're going to go even lower probably by the end here. Um, that's not always the case. Sometimes at mid-construction, there's all kinds of things that, that could get screwed up along the way by uh, 
people putting in other penetrations in the air barrier, what have you. But this house is well on its way and it's going to pass. So in many of the past programs, people will get an Energuide rating. And that's what the base of the energy modeling most people are doing. Not all energy advisors do the Energuide rating. And what that would do, the Energuide rating, it would give you a label that looks like this. And it would say, a typical new house, right here, this particular was 97 gigajoules a year. And that typical new house is a home as if it was built to the National Building Code standards, right? So it says, if you follow the code, which is very similar to the BC code, it would be 97. And that's based on this particular home in this location. This was a home in New West, uh, built to this size um, and this design. So it said, this, is the, this home built to cone would be 97. However, it includes the electrical base load, so lighting, hot water <coughs> consumption. Step code does it a little bit differently. What they do is they say, it's not this house, the label you'd have on your house, Instead, it's a combination of your space heating and cooling, your water heating, your building envelope, which is windows, insulation, uh, your assembly, and your air leakage, and your mechanical ventilation. It doesn't include base loads. So what they do, the step code, take it without base loads. So it's the same thing as the Interguide Reference House without base loads. So in the case of a step three home, they have to be 20% better than code, it says, for step three. You have to be 20% better than code. This house is 62% better than code, according to that metric. So that is surpassing the step four requirement of 40% better, right? It's beating mechanical energy use intensity. That's a maximum. It gets a little confusing here, because you have to have at least 20, and this is over 20, so you're passing here, you're pass, pass. If you weren't passing on percentage lower than reference house, then there's all kinds of options to do. Because it almost includes everything, includes air leakage, heating systems, uh, your foundation insulation, your attic insulation, your everything. You have all kinds of options to pass. What's included in here? Now, if we look at this now, on this other thing on this envelope, there's a, it says, what's your building characteristics summary? And it says, your energy advisor from your plans or information the builder provides them needs to completely fill this out. And the building inspectors are going to check. So what it shows is, if you don't pass some percentage less than reference house, and this is step one, when it's all focused on, and we'll focus on that in a minute. It's everything. You have so many options. Let's just say you were just off by a little bit, then Stan or another energy advisor could give you all kinds of options. You could do better windows. You could do a better heating system. So you have all the choice in the world at step one, or any other step to help get this step, to meet this step. The other element of this one, too, is mechanical energy use intensity. There's two targets for the mechanical energy use intensity. One, there's a, a primary target that you have to achieve. But two, it's also be a cooling system and the size of the home. So what you kind of use this chart is you go, okay, what size is your home? This is larger than uh, 210 square meters, and it has a cooling system, it has a heat pump. So what's your target? It's this big here, you have to meet 55. They give an allowance uh, for, the step code has given allowance for people with cooling systems because they didn't want people to not put a cooling system in as they think people are going to increasingly need it as it gets hotter because they were worried about the energy penalty. The saying, of, well, we give people a target and they're not putting in heating systems and they, even they say, no, no, we're, we're not going to pass if we put in a, 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 something that's going to have cooling energy. Then they felt, well, one, they may over time get pushback from consumers who want to put cooling in, and two, they're trying to say, so they're giving an allowance. Mechanical energy used over a year, normalized by square meter of heated floor area, expressed in kilowatt hours. So again, because this is a larger home, it takes all the mechanical energy you're using from your heat pump, from your gas furnace, uh, from your ventilation, and it divides it by the floor area. So larger homes, it becomes a little bit easier to achieve the MUI. The MUI, the other way I would explain it is, the less mechanical equipment you have, or the more efficient the equipment is, the lower your MUI. It also goes, again, the smaller your MUI, the larger the home, because you're dividing it can be smaller as well. So, Again, step five homes where people are saying we're really focusing on a really huge amount of building envelope, you need much, you mean a much, much smaller heating system in a, like a passive house, right? So the MUI for that is quite small. You're gonna have a small heating system. Some uh, passive houses don't have any heating systems and they, they focus on um, you know, having HRVs and uh, you know, maybe a small auxiliary some heat of some sort. Solar's not part of the step code, uh, so they don't, uh, it's not accounted. In the Energuide rating system, you can get extra sort of points for that, but it's not included within the step code. So if we're to now look at this sheet, where you list on here, what's the MUI? Your MUI in this particular house, and we'll take a look at it, is a natural gas furnace and an air source heat pump, and it's the water heating. 
So that's what your MUI is. If you weren't passing your MUI, your energy advisor would go, well, you need to do something different here. Your gas furnace you put isn't in for this particular home is not efficient enough. You need to go for a higher efficiency uh, furnace. So in this particular case, it's 94. They might say, well, you need to go with a 98 or some other example, right? That's what you would have to do. Or um, you don't have a heat pump. You need to put your, you know, you need a better heat pump or you need a, a higher efficiency um, hot water heating system if you're not passing on your MUI. Again, there's more options with the MUI because you have the option, a better guide rating system, which we looked at, they already passed on this. So we were passed, you didn't even need to hit that MUI. You could have done it. But this shows right now that they've met the step five MUI requirement in this home. And that's partly in relation to the size of the home. But there is an interrelation. You can use either of those. So one of the two, again, that's everything. You have all the options in the world. Here, heating space and hot water heating systems. That's what you need to have. Again, what your building inspector would do is they would look to make sure when they come and look that what you have in this report, and it says here, is what you have in your house. And then they're going to look at this and they're going to go, great, okay, what was this, this in? It says heat pump, says gas furnace. Um, this seems like it's realistic, like you're going to hit that target, you're, no problem. Now we're going to look at the thermal energy demand intensity. Thermal energy demand intensity is your annual heating required for space conditioning, air conditioning, conditioning, and ventilation air. And then again, it's normalized by square meter of area of the conditioned space. So what that means is your heat loss and heat gain from your, from your walls, your foundation, all your air leakage through your air barrier, types of windows you have, your heat recovery from your exhaust ventilation, but it also takes into consideration solar heat gain. So when the energy model looks at it, well, you got a whole bunch of south-facing windows, takes that into consideration and your internal gains from occupants and equipment. So the modeling software does an assumption on how much, well, if you've got people in this home, how much heat are you generating? And it takes all these things into consideration. The other way we like to explain, Teddy, is how much heat do we need to replace heat loss? How much are we losing? And how much do we need to bring in? So if you have a lot of air leakage, you're losing more heat, and you're going to have a higher Teddy. If you have lower air leakage, you're going to have a lower Teddy. So the more efficient the building envelope, the lower your Teddy number is. That's why you see it like step five, the Teddy's only 15. And that's where your cases where you are getting to, well, we're having much, much more tight or below one air change per hour. And you're having, you know, you are having those much thicker walls, triple pane windows, etc. All of your stuff on the Teddy, if you weren't passing your Teddy, these are all the things. One of these things your energy advisor would work with you and said, okay, where do we have give your pre-construction report before you started? Where, do we, where would you go? Would you go for a higher efficiency window? Nope. Uh, better air barrier system, do you feel confident on that one? They might be like, well, I don't feel I like can get better than that given we haven't built that many homes at that level. Then it'd be okay, well, let's focus on, uh, you know, usually your wall insulation is like where it's going or your, you know, what's, what you're doing in your basement. Those are the types of things you're focusing on when you think about the Teddy. And on this one, it just hits the Teddy. So it's 30, right? So while we're swimming advanced, pass, pass with, by miles, on this, because this is a larger home, we're just sitting right on the knob there. So they're fine, they're gonna hit it. Nothing's changing now, no one's taking out these walls or windows, so you're not gonna pass. The one factor that is the wild card with this is the air leakage. If something along the way got blotched and they missed their air leakage, we know that's not gonna happen based on their approach and the builder and how much care they're putting into this, that's where they could lose on the Teddy. And this shows right here. While they're at 1.1, at mid-construction, if they got to 1.38, that would impact and maybe they'd have, you know, 31. And that means they would not pass on the Teddy. So when you're working with your energy advisor and going through this whole process, if they were showing whatever your design was, you're closer on some of these things, that says, what are the variables that might make it where you might not pass? This is their, okay, are you confident that you're going to hit this? The builder now, it made construction that says, well, it's going to get even tighter with this home as they put drywall in, as they finish the last air barrier and stuff. So it's not going to be an issue. So it's no problem. Stan's like, yep, you, you're, you're good to go. If it wasn't clear, if there was a bunch of poly approach, for example, and there was way more opportunities, which we'll talk a little bit later, way more opportunities for things to go wrong, the poly getting, you know, uh, cut, other plant penetrations going through, then it'd be like, if you're right on the cusp, the, the advisor would be, whoa, okay, you're pretty close, too close for comfort here on various things. You should actually consider making an adjustment somewhere else in this home when your plans to make sure you hit it. When you, when you're not, just in case, right? Because you don't know what's going to happen. And um, given that uh, Stan knows this builder's been building airtight homes for quite some time, 
like he would know if you, if you haven't built homes this level of airtightness consistently, then it's we, we got to like take way more caution in that approach. Um, and Stan, maybe would you want to just talk about how when you're working with an energy advisor to set these targets, how you would talk about air leakage? Each step has a different requirement for air tightness. Uh, as you saw earlier, step one does not have that, but step two, three, four, five have progressively tighter or more difficult targets. Uh, step three, as you see the blue circle there, requires 2.5. Almost always, when I for the proposed, I just put down 2.5. Uh, I have a lot of, step code is new for a lot of builders, including builders I've worked with previously. And I know some of them, they're getting, on previous houses, they're getting 5.5 on their duplex units, 6 on their duplex units. And now they're having to reach 2.5. So I'm certainly not going to put anything more aggressive than 2.5. If I could, if I could put something better, 1.5, that, that's of benefit to the builder because it means they're going to save some energy and it might mean that they can stick with a thinner wall, a 2 by 6 instead of a 2 by 8 or cheaper windows instead of the better windows. But we can't know that they'll do that. So in other words, it's risky to choose a really aggressive airtight value for the airtightness requirement. So almost always, I just go with the worst case that passes. <coughs> and in this case, for step three, it's 2.5. Uh, what Peter touched on earlier about the just meeting the Teddy, the 30, uh, when choosing upgrades, energy advisors usually, they try to provide a buffer to, to mitigate risk. Risk of what? Uh, as Peter pointed out, really the only variable should be the air tightness, air leakage. But stuff seems to happen. Uh, I find that what gets built isn't always what's on the sheet. Um, if you're going to deviate from the plans, which should be the same as the compliance report, uh, do let the energy advisor know so that they can then decide, oh, that's pretty significant. Let me pipe, pump that through the model and see what the result is. And then they can let you know. It doesn't mean you can't do that change, but if you really want to, maybe we need to fiddle with something else to keep you in line uh, for meeting the tenant. And that's why when you look at this cheat, understanding what's involved, and they give you, uh, the energy advisor gives you something, and you're sitting on line. Again, we're looking at a step three. We'll look at step one. No local governments right now, I don't think, are putting in step three requirements. No, sure. No, sure. Okay, right. Yeah. Yeah, Squamish. Yeah. So we're looking at a step three. So this is it. Again, knowing what this means, you're on the line and what's, what's there. And then you're planning a change. Oh, we're, the, the, all of a sudden my client wants way more windows. They said, okay, I really want to, you know, double the size of the windows here. That would be something as, okay, you want double the size of the windows. We're sitting on the line. We better let the energy advisor know how that's changing so we can put it in. Is that going to tip us over the edge on this 30? Maybe not, but then it's, if they don't know that and then in the end they come back to the, the, this pre-construction report, this has been given in, but nothing's settled yet, right? It's, it's the final construction, the final as-built report that you give to the equipment that, that sort of may hold up your occupancy permit. So if there's changes that happen along the way, on that window one, for example, maybe it's not going to there, but you should know and let the energy advisor know. Same thing with mechanical energy use intensity. If you're switching from, uh, oh, we had a heat pump initial plan and then they decided, no, we want to go with a gas furnace. That's a pretty big change. And if you don't, and you're, if you're sitting on your cusp here, just passing, that's something you need to let your energy advisor know because those are things that might impact your ability to pass or not. What we hope one of the takeaways from here coming out of these things is trying to decipher this is like, what is included in this metric? So you know what that is. Air tightness is kind of clear. Thermal energy de demand intensity is sort of less clear until you start thinking about it. It's about the things in your house that are keeping the heat in, that's essentially what it is. Mechanical energy use intensity is the things that are, you know, generating space heat and hot water heat. What we want all you to feel when you come out and a building inspector says, oh, you're pretty close on the Teddy, you want to be like, I know exactly what you're talking about, what we need to do. So you, you come out of it and go, right, I know it's this, I know it's that. That's one of our goals is today. So you all really feel as comfortable as possible with what these step code metrics mean. And then some of the trade-offs you can make. So we, you know, we've talked about this a little bit, but more about working with an energy advisor. So who can do this? One is that the Building and Safety Standards Grant says, who can do this for you? Well, it's an energy advisor registered with Natural Resources Canada, the certified passive house designer or consultant, 
or other types of consultants using approved modeling software, right? So this basically, these are the types of people that can do it for you. With a step code, it's even more important now because there are pass or fails, right? You may not get your occupancy permit if you don't hit step two in the Township of Langley. Um, so you have to pass. So, and within that too, you have to make sure that the people at, at, the, uh, at the permitting office are going to look at your plans. They're going to look at this compliance report. And when they come to the house, they expect all these things are going to line up. If your plans don't match what's in the compliance report, they're, they're not going to want to see that happen. And they may hold things up. They are requiring air barrier details on plans, I believe, for step three and above. So you're going to have to show that. While it's optional, there's a mid-construction blower door test. If you don't do it at mid-construction and you do it at the end, it could be much, much more expensive to fix it at the end. Whereas now, as you see, uh, everything's open. Most of the things that we look at later are really quick fixes, like very quick. It's some spray foam and some caulking, done. After that's sealed up trying to do that, it can get very expensive, right? So I think, as we said on, on this one, it's like uh, air tightness is the wild card, right? You know if you put a heating system and you give it, if they model it, that heating system is that, you're going to pass. This you're going to pass, this you're going to pass, this you're going to pass. Again, what, what happens on your air barrier? Well, those are little things that can happen. It might not have been like, you know, one of your subtrades might have made that issue. You didn't even know it was there, right? And all kinds of issues can happen between mid construction and final construction. Not over proposing, like step three, Stan would say, you should always just go unless you're really, really confident for 2.5. If step three is the requirements 2.5, don't go above that because if you don't hit it, you've given yourself no buffer. Again, Township of Langley, step three and above, they're going to require you in your building plans to show where your air barrier is, basically red line. This is where it is. They're going to ask, what's your plan? The intent of that is the saying is, at the planning stage, based on what you're doing, you're thinking about it from that point. After you're thinking about where the air barrier is going to be, and this is also important for the energy advisor early for them to know when they get the plans, they see, okay, I know what your air barrier is. How many homes you've built of this type before? Okay, let's, 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 let's give you the best air leakage rating in your report plan the rest of your building around it so I can make sure you hit the step code targets. Marking the location of the air barrier on the house, on that section, some of it may seem obvious, and might seem unnecessary, but one issue that I see in a lot of my houses are uh, living space over uh, outside space. So let, like, let's say um, there's an attached garage and there's living space over it. Uh, coach houses have that often. I, I often get a lot of leakage there, so I'll ask the, the builder, oh, so what do we have for an air, so pretend there's an attached garage under us and that this is a living room. So I'll ask, What's, what do we have for air sealing here? And they'll look at me and say, we don't have one. Uh, like one actually said, oh, uh, I'm not allowed to put poly under. And, and, and he's half right, you're not allowed to put poly just above the garage because poly being the vapor barrier needs to stay towards the warmer part of the house. So he's half right, but he could have, the, his framer could have put poly over top the joist and then the subfloor, so, so, so he was only half right. But, but the reason why I bring this up is most of the time there is no air barrier. It turns out plywood subfloor is, well, is airtight, but then you've got these tongue and groove joints. So are you handling those joints properly? If yes, and if at the edges, we're having that probably, then you're good, but if not, or maybe there's a bathroom here and they cut a big hole for the drain pipe and no one seals it up. And so that's why having that plan is important. You know, you know we all know for walls, oh yeah, well, poly for sure, and we know the, the attic ceiling, poly for sure, but the, the example I just gave, it seems right. it's not so well like, known. Uh, I would never advise my framework to put poly on top of joints. No, and, 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 and I've never so seen that, it before. So then what's your solution, though, for that? If it is true you can't do poly in the garage, right? and we're not doing poly on the joists because all the framers would fall right through it, uh, what's the next solution for that floor? Uh, I'll, I'll get to you next. Um, yeah. I, I, my suggestion is to use the plywood. and. And to paint it? Uh, oh no, no pl uh, plywood as long as it's of a certain thickness. And I believe subfloors are already three quarter or five eighths. Depending, on, depending on the span of your joints, but three quarter. Oh, okay. Shape. Uh, three quarter so, so the plywood itself is in good shape. Uh, what one? I, I had this very conversation with. But that's considered a vapor barrier. Mm -hmm. uh, vapor Plyo and is? air. Yes. Really? Yes. Uh, um, so actually, just to continue with that train of thought, it's surprising how much of what we see here is airtight. Um, 
Uh, the concrete behind here is airtight. Mm -hmm. The styrofoam is airtight. Uh, wood is airtight, right? Wood is airtight. Um, drywall is airtight. Poly, obviously. Uh, other forms of, of rigid insulation, like uh, polyiso, XPS, uh, two pound, half pound spray foam, uh, OSB. So in fact, there's probably more <laughs> materials that we use that are airtight than are, are not. Uh, now getting back to that, I would say uh, the easiest way, because you're already putting down the plywood, is just to handle the seams properly. And if you're gonna cut any holes, either for fresh water, drain water, electrical, to, to be mindful and to, to seal that up. So the intent of that, what, like what the Township of Langley is doing along the way is saying, requiring that airburger detail, is to get thinking about an early stage, right? You've come up with a plan. The other part of this too is, well, who's responsible for the build? Who's responsible for air barrier, right? Like in the past, it was sort of not, it wasn't really anyone's responsibility, really. So what's the plan? Who's gonna make sure it's implemented? Who's gonna fix issues? Who's gonna do quality control? And if someone's got that within their job description, this ghost person is, who's the person who does that? And the other one is just being, someone's alert, like, okay, well, you know, whether it's damage or intentional, there's a penetration that's put through, right? Well, who's responsible for, for plugging that penetration, right? Is it, the, is it the trade who puts it through or is it the general? Well, they, now let's look at step one. What it is here when you look at your target, this percentage less than the reference house. There's no air changes target, nothing there, right? There's no MUI, there's no Teddy. And the benefit of this is, and why it's been introduced this way, is it says, let's give builders as many options as possible to pass. Understanding where we're sitting with air tightness and where we looked at those median air leakage rates, we're seeing lots of people are probably aren't going to pass on step one if they put a set of target, even if they set it quite high. So they said, technically, you could build a home that was, you know, 10 air changes an hour, more, and still pass. However, because there's an assumption in the underguide rating system, the reference house, as good as the reference house, there's 2.5. If you're building 10, you're going to need to do a bunch of other things to pass. Let's just say, you, you, you're going to achieve 2.5. That means you can do everything basically as you have done to code. Code windows, code insulation, no HRV, standard hot water tank. That's it. You're going to pass, right? So it's saying this isn't radically different from the step code at step one, right? This is just building a house to code, but hitting 2.5 air changes. And likely, I, w I think most energy advisors would not say, assume you're going to hit 2.5, uh, unless you know you're going to hit it. They probably say, well, no, let's, let's do something different. Maybe you're going to go to 3.5 or higher. And if it was 3.5, it said, well, you're not just standard code wall insulation. Now you have to do R22 or an HRV. So one of these two things. Or a bunch of other things. But yeah, or, or you could do both. Or a bunch of these. He's going to give you, uh, he or she will give you a bunch of options. But it's going to be something additional, right? It's not just code anymore. And same thing as if you had gone to 4.5. Well, now you're going to have to go to R28 or an HRV. And you're going to have to do better windows. So part of this does, there's all kinds of trade-offs and all kinds of options, or a better heating system. Like Again, the options go on and on, but you're gonna have to do more. If you focus on a good air barrier plan, and you do it well, this can be less costly for you, right? This is, this is doing good poly, this is good labor, this is paying attention to details. This is understanding where the common leakage areas are, right? So the intent of it, it doesn't need to be more expensive. It's a co-built home but airtight. Well, this is kind of what, we sh what, what the intent of code was supposed to be happening all along. And part of the reason why the step code's here is that code wasn't really working in the past as it should have been because homes weren't being built at 2.5 hour changes. We have the data that shows that, right? Um, and when we don't have homes that are built that airtight, then you know, we potentially have you know, moisture getting in the walls. We potentially have you know, people are paying more for energy than they should have, et cetera, et cetera. We might have structural integrity issues over time. Uh, in reality, as Peter's such a step one is nothing more than the house you built two or three or four years ago. It's simply the prescriptive BC building code as far as energy goes in, in 936, um, which, which as you know, you guys, if you've been building for a while, know, uh, USI 1.8 windows, that's your typical double glazed window. Walls typically two by six, R20 bat, and, and so on. There's, there's that table in the code, R28 if it's a flat ceiling, R40 if it's an attic ceiling. Uh, so step one is only asking for that, except, and, and Peter's mentioned this a number of times, it, it, this is a big but, air tightness is the one that's a bit weird. Uh, although windows, walls, ceilings, I've chimed off numbers and you, you guys are familiar with them, nobody's ever, the house you guys built three years ago, nobody, no inspector ever said, 
oh, so did you meet 2.5? I mean, you would just look at them and say, 2.5 what? Um, the code doesn't say for prescriptive that you need to meet 2.5, but there's an underlying assumption, and that's what this reference house that you need to beat is. There's an assumption in the national code that says, you know, windows this, walls this, and we assume that everybody in the country is building houses to 2.5. Well, as Peter's point out, we're not, in the, low, in the nice mile, lower mainland, we're not even close to that. But if it's, say, uh, builders, builders basically new to this, I'll, I'll choose four point something. And, and admittedly, even that's, it, that actually would take some work on the builder's part because when I s started working on, on more, a lot of new construction back in the early 2010s, n builders didn't have experience. Well, they were generally hitting fives. Five and a quarter was a typical number. So I'm not using five and a quarter, I'm using mid fours. Sometimes I'll put five, but, but at the same time, I'm strongly encouraging the mid-construction test, which will help that five and a quarter builder to get a four. We know some uh, builders in the island just changed the way they're building foundations. They're like, we can do this way more efficient, way more cost effectively than in the past. We're just going to start doing that because we're saving money getting more efficiencies. They're just sort of changing the way they did it. And they wouldn't have done that until they were forced to start trying it out. And they were like, oh, this is actually way better. On that particular scenario, I think it's, uh, it's an, it's an, it was an insulated concrete type scenario. Yeah. And they weren't doing that in the past. So now they're, do they're doing that too. So they've switched. Yeah, they've switched and, and the how they're doing things. So basically now they're saying is, well, we're building things very differently uh, than they used to. And they're saying as well, and some of them are, th they're finding niche markets in those types of homes. They're just like, we're only building this level now. And, and, and often people asking for those level two or have, you know, more change. So they're able to, you know, charge a premium too. So they're sort of, th that's where they're finding niche. But they're also finding good cost efficiency. They could go for any type of home, right? It doesn't have to be step five. It could be you're building a better foundation so again, you can build better in different places and get more of your gain in this home and do something different somewhere else, right? So it's not, it's not you can you know, mix and match. It's like Lego of different things you can put together as long as the combined house meets that energy efficiency requirement. Where we're coming back to this, this chart again, this is the key chart. And each decision sort of along the way in the planning stage as you're planning can impact these metrics, right? So as you're planning along the way, you need to think about these things. Again, on this home, totally fine on mechanical energy use intensity and lower than reference house. On Teddy, they're good because everything's there with air leakage on their way. On the check to pass here too, they would also just let them know, okay, who tested this? They would know this is an energy advisor using the Interguide rating system. This is the chart you want to become familiar with over time. It, those are the elements. In the end of the day, part of what they're looking at here is the energy advisor, in this case Stan, has to sign off on this. So he's had to come and look and various things and sign off and it does add an, another element to the, the compliance and they're trying to say, well, yep, we do have had a third party. The local government's going to do their inspections as they do. Um, although in some local government areas, they're starting to, it seems like maybe be doing, you know, moving towards doing some less inspections and having more third parties verify certain things. It seems there's some trends where some local governments are starting to think about that. Um, one, because they're realizing um, a test that looks at air leakage is better than someone walking around and, and trying to visually look at the air barrier, which they realize has limitations. Now, for those of you, does anyone here build townhomes? Yeah, probably a lot. So in the step code, um, the step code says that you're going to, it looks at the whole building, right? So if you have a four unit complex, it says your, your step code metric should be all four buildings, but you're, you're building four individual units. Um, the code also doesn't require an air barrier between units. However, we know there's a lot of air leakage between units. Um, and while the step code's been in for a little while, they're just finally coming out with some, some actually uh, technical requirements for doing the blower door testing that sort of, now they're finalized it, it's been happening. And basically what they're saying now is, this is complicated with a lot of numbers, they're saying is you're gonna do a blower door test on each unit, and then you're gonna add them up. Well, blower doors on each unit, and then they're gonna allow you to minus 0.5 from each unit. So let's just say this end unit right here is 3.5. They've said because they, they recognize the challenges with people meeting air tightness on townhomes and the inter-party wall leakage, they're going to give you a sort of 0.5 air change per hour sort of bonus, like adjustment. So this brings it down to three. We've done all along. We know there's more leakage in middle units because there's party wall leakage. So they're going to say they adjust it. And then they're going to basically 
divide it by the surface area, add it up. So essentially summing up the air leakage, it, dividing it by the surface area of the home, and then it gives you one air leakage of 3.28 for this particular scenario. Even though it started with all there, your average here is 3.28. So you're not going to pass step two with that, but you will pass step one. And what it gives you an approach now to test the whole unit. You can still do air, air tightness tests where someone have four blower doors and they do that. Or if there was openings between the homes still be for some reason because you had the, the build whatever and you could still do it. You can still do that as well. But then you would lose your 0.5 air tightness. And then what they've tried to do now is they realized there was complications doing the testing along. People were at different points in their build, like this one was complete. Th you know, those ones weren't complete yet, so it was getting really complicated to do the testing. And there was a lot of inter-unit leakage, so it was, your, it was all kinds of things really you weren't getting an accurate reading. So this is the process that's been come up, at least for in the interim, so what you would need to do. You would need to have all four units complete, or you can do it at different times along the way, I guess, as long as you get the case there. But you would need to do them at four different tests, which you could do all in one day or on different days, but they this would be the calculation that happens behind the scenes. Um, in the end of the day, where we're going is, while the code doesn't require it yet, likely where it's probably going to be going is that you know, people are realizing the importance of an air barrier between units for you know, all kinds of reasons. You know, smoke doesn't go, or smells, or odors. or um, you know, If there was a fire in a house and there's a lot of air leakage, that is a safety concern. So likely where things are going is that you know, people are realizing that compartmentalization for these types of buildings is important. But it's not a code requirement yet. Um, but as Stan says, he always encourages his builders that he works with to try and get that air barrier as best as possible, uh, as that it's just good building practice for one. And you are going to do better on your testing when he does it individually by unit. So just on that too, looking at townhomes, if you're getting a compliance report like this, there is going to be another version for townhomes. You're still going to have that one chart for the four units, a four unit building, but you're going to have one teddy, right? Maybe it's an eight unit. So the similar process that's been evolved is again the same thing. Add them up and then you're basically dividing by the heated floor area in this case and coming up with one teddy. So even though no, there's different teddies for each unit, they're at, it's basically a game, you know, adding and uh, dividing game. Um, so the same thing what happens for this, so, so you can get one teddy. Again, each of those units, well, there's two different, you know, most of them, there's three different, four different teddies, three different teddies for those four units. Even though it's four different, they're going to make you do it for the whole building. Again, this doesn't work for all multi-unit residential buildings. If it fell into a category, this is for more for town, like side-by-side -side townhome, row homes, various things. If it's a stacked, there's a different process. Or if there is a larger common area, that's a different type of energy modeling too, and you're modeling the whole building. Um, in that particular case, let's just say the doors were here, and there was a whole common front area, then you would just open all the doors in all four units and put your blower door in the one big main entrance and then it would be one big building. So you do a different test. So it depends on the building type. Depending on what you build, you may not be in part nine modeling. We're, we're talking about part nine, single family detached, row homes, townhomes, not multi-unit residential buildings. Even though this is sort of a multi-unit residential building, it's in the, for the step code purposes, it's, it's, you know, it's a part nine uh, type building. For those are, that are interested in learning more about the step code or finding resources, there's the Energy Step Code website that has lots of interesting information on it. Um, among that information is, you know, there's various bulletins about how things are changing or air tightness if you want to really understand or there's someone on your team that really wants to understand it. There's also a range of different builder guides and manuals that sort of explain uh, a range of different things. Some of you give more examples, like if, if you're looking at step one. Well, here's your options to get step one. If you get 3.5, here's two things you might need to do. There's all kinds of different examples. You were just trying to orientate yourself like, what is it going to take for me to build uh, you know, step three or four or five? It'll give some examples, right? So you can kind of orientate yourself. Similarly, there's all kinds of uh, information on achieving airtight buildings that talks about different strategies and approaches for, for air barrier approaches and different products. There's different trainings that are available. While we're talking today more like practical and talking about the step code, there are trainings that'll show you like, here's how you apply a SIGA tape. Here's how you, you know, uh, here's how you might do an air barrier approach on this top sill plate or wherever. So you actually have hands-on training. And we heard one of the builders uh, that was at the session this morning said he took it and he thought it was fantastic. 
So what they do is have like a, a model assembly and you actually just mm -hmm. practice doing the air leakage on it and you do a test on it. So it's like, here's this tape. And then someone talks to you about, here's the issues with this tape, here's how you use it well, uh, different products and things. This is also on the Stepco website. Times there's subsidies for people builders to take that have been paid for by the utilities. There had been up to very recently. Uh, there probably likely will be again. So that covers a lot of the cost for taking it. If you're interested in learning about the incentives and rebates, this is for and existing homes, if you, your homeowner want to do upgrades on your existing home or you do renovations, and for new homes. So there's a, a betterhomes.bc.ca, and this is a provincial government website that actually our organization develops and runs, um, that find rebates for building a home. So if you want to know, Township of Langley has incentives. Other local governments are coming in for incentives for building homes to step code. Over time, you're like, well, I got them building in Surrey now. What are they doing? You can go onto this website, search Surrey, and it'll bring up any incentives that are available. You'd see the, the Township of Langley incentive. It would show you that. It would also show you the Fortis incentive that's available there too. Uh, the likely BC Hydro is having talk of coming in with an incentive for electrically heated homes as well. And that'll be changing over time, maybe this fall. By the way, I'll just mention, I was just speaking with Fortis, that those dollars that you see, they go to the builder. They, they said that their intention is absolutely for the money to go to the builder and not the homeowner. I only say this because I've had a lot of trouble trying to get my builders to give me the information I need to do the application, probably because they figure there's nothing <coughs> in it for them, but that money's yours. If you're looking for energy advisors, this tool, wherever you're at, Township of Langley, and it's gonna bring out, and it'll bring the list of the, the energy advisors who are qualified and provide that service in the Township of Langley. So wherever you are building and you wanted to find an energy advisor, you can find on this this new search tool. They can really um, be a good resource for you. What's the average cost for like a 4,000 square foot home for an energy advisor? Uh, let's say about 1,800. And, and that, that does include everything. So, so is it like so 40 cents a foot or something like that? Uh, I base it on, on I, I do base on how many thousand square feet it is. Um, so that, that does include the pre, uh, sorry, the pre-construction work, which is mostly modeling upgrades and the compliance reports. It also includes the mid-construction, which isn't mandatory, but I, I, I would rather offer it in my quote and wait for the builder to say he doesn't want it <laughs> than, than to offer it as an option, because uh, frankly, I think we would all like to see builders do, do them, at least for the time being. So it does include three stages of work, pre-construction, mid-construction, and final, and, uh, as well as the, the, fi the document submission. This does, if you do renovations, this also tool lets you know the incentives that are available in different local governments for installing a heat pump or a gas furnace or insulation as well, or for your own homes if you're doing upgrades. So there's a search tool for both. Also linked to that, um, if you have questions about any incentive programs, that loan also has a, like a 1-800 number you can call and say, great, I don't understand this Township of Langley incentive program, <laughs> uh, and they'll explain it to you. Or the Fortis one, they'll explain it to you. Same thing for existing homes. Or if you have basic questions about the step code, or other incentives that are available, they'll call and they'll be someone that will answer your questions and direct you to either answer it right there and or direct you to the right place. So that's our presentation for today. Thank you so much for your time and to um, Clay Construction and Dave for making um, this home available. We, this is a, a lot, it's been a great help for the Township of Langley um, and also to BC Hydro who's sponsored in Township of Langley who's sponsored and put on this event. Mm -hmm.